I got some brand new titles tonight that I didn't know I had. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for coming out tonight. Am, am I on? Not on? Now I'm on. I was turned on. It just wasn't the mic that was turned on. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. But th once again, thank you for coming out tonight. And it's always a joy to be here with your pastors and wonderful people. We've known them for a long, long time. And uh, I love coming to this part of California. And I love landing out there at that airport. My goodness, all those airplanes. Has anybody been to your airport out here? It's like a graveyard of airplanes from all over the world. There is no lack of money in this world. Most of us sitting out at your airport, just, just sitting there, you know. Billions of dollars in airplanes, you know. And when you like airplanes like I do, it gets your attention. I just, I just want to go out there and touch them all. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyway, we, we enjoy coming here and, and appreciate your pastors and glad you came tonight. You got your Bibles with you? Open them first of all tonight to Psalm 62. And as Eric said, uh, back in October of 2023, as I was seeking the Lord as to what would be my theme throughout 2024, he said this, and you might want to make a note of this. He said, tell the people everywhere you go in 2024, number one, stay in faith. Number two, remain focused on the promises of God. And then number three, do not allow anything that's happening in this world to distract you. Amen. He said, if they will do those three things, then tell them, I will cause their 2024 to be a year of progression, advancement, promotion, and as a bonus, their highest expectations being fulfilled. Now, once again, notice there are prerequisites. It, it, somebody asked me, said, well, is everybody in the body of Christ going to experience progression? No. God wants everyone to, but not everyone will be obedient. You know, uh, the Bible uh, lets us know that we are to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, and then you're blessed. If you're just a hearer only, then you, you, you can't expect the same blessings that the doer is a recipient of. Amen? That's right. So uh, God wants everybody blessed. God wants everybody experiencing this. But once again, there are certain principles that must be applied. And, of course, you know the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So, number one, stay in faith. Now, ask the Lord, why would you say that? Because there are a lot of people today that started out in faith that are not still in faith. Amen. I know pastors all over the world that I, I started preaching for. I'm in my 55th year of ministry. And, and pastors that I preached for years ago that started out in faith. In fact, I was part of their going into the ministry and, and, and helped launch them into their various churches across the country. And they, they were preaching the word of faith just like me, Brother Copeland, uh, Charles Capps, Brother Price, uh, and others, and, and we're seeing their churches grow because of it. But then when adversity came, and particularly when COVID came, some of those same churches I've gone back to, and they're not talking like they used to talk. They don't believe like they used to believe. Amen. So the body of Christ, I'm sorry to say, and I see them on a large scale, I'm not limited to California. I travel all over the world, and I see the body of Christ in great number. And many of them, I'm sorry to say, have, have, have let go of their faith. And the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, said, hold faith, holding faith. And he gave an example of some folks in his day that they started out in faith but d did not continue. And he said, and they've made shipwreck of their lives. Another translation said they made a thorough mess of their lives. And I see a lot of Christians like that today that, that started out and God was doing great things in their lives. And then, you know, when certain trouble came uh, and it looked like, you know, nothing is working, they give up. And uh, you give up on the Word of God, you will make a thorough mess of your life. Amen. And I don't think anybody here 
wants that testimony. Yes, How you doing today? I've made a thorough mess of my life. <laughs> no, that's not what I want. To, I, that's not my testimony, and I'm sure it's not going to be your, you don't want it to be your testimony. Right, right. Amen. So he said, number one, tell them to stay in faith. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in faith. And then number two, he said, and tell them to remain focused on the promises of God. Say that to somebody. Remain focused on the promises of God. And then I think this is, they're all important, but this one, remain, uh, do not allow anything that is happening in the world to distract you. You know, how many of you remember the parable of the sower sows the word? Mark chapter 4. Jesus said that once the word is sown in a person's heart, Satan comes immediately to take it away, okay? Because he knows you're no threat to him when you have no word in you, but a serious threat to him when you have the word in you. And so he says he comes immediately to steal the word so that you won't be a threat to him or his operations. And Jesus gave a list of certain things that he would use to steal the word out of people's heart. Now, if you read it from the Amplified Bible, it says that one of the things that Satan will use is the distractions of the age. The distractions of the age. And there are more distractions today than ever. Now, I've been walking with the Lord, preaching the gospel for 55 years, my 55th year, and I've never seen more distractions in all my years of serving the Lord as there are right now. Amen. And one of the big reasons for that is social media. People are addicted to social media. And, you know, people are always trying to push that on me. Right, Jerry? And they send me stuff from social media, want me to read it. I don't want to read that junk. Somebody said, don't you want to be informed? Are you kidding me? That's where you get your information, social media? I get mine from W-O-R-D, Word of God. Amen. Amen. They don't know what's going to happen next. It's all, you know, speculation. I know what's going to happen next. I read the back of the book. We win. <laughs> we win. Hallelujah. Anybody happy about the fact that we, we are, uh, are going to win this deal? Hallelujah. So why get so frustrated and bent out of shape, as I'd say in Texas, over things that are not even permanent anyway? I heard Brother Copeland say one time, he said, you know why they have to reprint the newspaper every day? <laughs> because 24 hours later, it's old news. He said, why, why do you want to believe something that they're going to have to reprint tomorrow? He said, be as smart as the bird. You put a newspaper in the bird cage, and he knows what to do with it. <laughs> that was Brother Copeland. I didn't say that. It was Brother Copeland, okay? <laughs> Amen. So why, why, why get all bent out of shape over something that's not even permanent? Paul said, uh, he said, uh, things which are seen are temporal. Things that can be perceived by the five physical senses, they're not permanent, they're temporary. Amen. Amen. And yet the body of Christ, uh, it's, it's sad to see it, have, have began to allow the distractions of the age to steal the word, steal their hope, steal, steal uh, their expectations. Amen. So he said, tell them if they'll stay in faith, remain focused on the promises of God. And by the way, you do know the promises of God are yea and amen. Yea means affirmative and amen means so be it. You can't get any more positive than affirmative and so be it. So that's why it's important to remain focused on the promises. Hallelujah. And then once again, don't allow anything that is happening in the world to distract you. And if you do those things, the Lord said to me, tell them, I'll cause their 2024 to become a year of progression, advancement, promotion, and their highest expectations being fulfilled. Now every year, and you've heard me say this when I've heard it in the past, uh, when, when I go before the Lord to, to ask him what is the word that you would have me, the prophetic word that you would have me to emphasize and focus on uh, throughout the year wherever I might go. And every year he's given me a word since 1991 
when Brother Copeland prophesied over me that there was a new direction coming to my ministry, and he had included the office of the seer, which is part of the prophetic ministry, and said, God's going to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them with the body of Christ wherever he might send you. And then later, Brother Hagin prophesied that over me. And then later, Brother Oral Roberts prophesied it over me. And then later, all in the same year, within months of each other, T.L. and Daisy Osmond prophesied that over me. These were my four mentors. And so since that time, I, I've set aside the first couple of weeks in October just to seek the Lord ask, and see what he might say to me and see what he might show me. And then once he does, uh, I say to him, now, Lord, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it if you would confirm this in my life and ministry now so that when I take it to the rest of the world, it will add validity to the, to the message. And every year he's done that. He's been faithful to it. I've already experienced progression, and we're just into April. I've already experienced some promotion. I've already experienced some advancement, and I have already seen some of my highest expectations fulfilled. Amen. Amen. And not only that, I'm getting testimonies from people all over the world who've heard me preach it, and they're experiencing it. And God's no respecter of persons, so look at somebody and say, I might be next. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody interested in progressing, yes. advancing, yes. promotion? Yes. The Bible says promotion comes from God. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. And then, of course, having your highest expectations fulfilled. Now, obviously, every time I preach this, I get new insight, new revelation, and I can't cover everything I've learned about this subject since October 2023. So I just have to, in one service, I just have to listen to the Lord to, to ask what specific area of this do you want me to emphasize tonight? And tonight, and, and this afternoon, we arrived here, and uh, I was, had some time uh, to prepare for the service. I sense the leading of the Lord to emphasize the expectation part of it, the highest expectations being fulfilled. Anybody have any high expectations? Anybody expecting some big things? Amen. Are there any big dreamers in the house? You know, I've been so privileged in my life. I mean, I, you talk about the favor of God. I've been so privileged in my life to be associated with and to become very close friends with and uh, uh, preach with these, these four men I mentioned. And each one of them had a major part in my life as a mentor. And, and Kenneth Copeland, most of you know, I've, uh, I've, I've preached with Brother Copeland 54 out of my 55 years. And, and that's almost unheard of today. Two preachers still together, yeah. no competitive no jealousy, you know. I mean, we're still together, still a team, even though we're two separate ministries. But he imparted so much into me in my early days. Now, he, he went full-time into ministry in 67. He came to my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana in 69. So he was two years ahead of me is when I surrendered my life in 69. Then I moved to Fort Worth and went to work with him and and and. He, traveling with him, that was my Bible school. And I told Brother Hagin one time, if you'd had Rama when I got saved in 69, I'd have been one of your first students, you know. But they didn't have Rama then. But I traveled with Brother Copeland all over the country. And every, every meeting was my Bible school. You probably heard me tell this story about uh, back in those early days. We didn't go anywhere for one night. We went everywhere we went three weeks at a time. Three services a day. And Brother Copeland, you know, I'd set up the auditoriums and, and I'd, I'd set up the sound system and, and I'd open the service in prayer and I might make some announcement or something. And then I would turn it to Brother Copeland and he might sing uh, a song first or he might share something. And, and he'd, he'd, when he's ready to preach, now I'm sitting on the platform with a little Radio Shack amplifier and recorder, and I'm, I'm supposed to record all the messages. I remember reel-to-reel -reel tapes. So I'm recording on a reel-to-reel -reel tape. I'm sitting there waiting for my cue. And when Brother Copeland was ready to preach, he'd turn like this, turn me on, Jerry. And I'd turn the recorder on, make sure I'm getting good recording. 
And then I put the headset down, and now I'm a student. And I'm in those services, three services a day for three weeks. That's 21 services <laughs> or more, you know. And, uh, well, uh, well, a week was 21 services, and then two more weeks added to it, you know. So I heard these things every day, every day. And every day I heard this, turn me on Jerry, turn me on Jerry, turn me on Jerry. <laughs> three times a day, three weeks, turn me on Jerry. I'd just like to announce, if it hadn't been for Jerry Savelle, Kenneth Copeland would have never got turned on. <laughs> Amen. So I heard these messages, and they were life-changing. And, of course, my wife, Carolyn, is back home raising our two little girls. And she didn't get to travel with me. So I would come home, and I'd try to preach everything I learned on that trip to her so that we'd, we would grow in faith together, you know. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And so I would share. I took notes all the time on every sermon, and then I'd, I'd preach them to her as best I could, trying to preach it like Brother Copeland, you know, and uh, so that our faith would grow together. And then, of course, I learned about Kenneth Hagin's ministry through Brother Copeland. And, and I'd hear him talk about Kenneth Hagin often and how much he'd learned from Kenneth Hagin in those early days. And then finally I was able to, uh, go to a Kenneth Hagin meeting and, and find out, you know, why Brother Copeland was so impressed by his ministry. And, of course, I was as well. And then later became close friends with Brother Hagin, preached with him all over the country. And he's in my home. I'm in his home. And what a great relationship that was. I learned tons from Brother Hagin. And, of course, as Eric said, I heard the call to preach in 1957 in my grandmother's home in Oklahoma City uh, when somebody turned her old black and white Phil Code television set on, and the first image that came on was Oral Roberts preaching under the big tent, his most, which became his most famous tent sermon called The Fourth Man. And I'd never heard of Oral Roberts. And I'm captivated. I'm standing in front of that television, captivated by his message. And I heard, and I didn't know it was God at the time. I thought it was one of my cousins standing next to me. But I heard, and it wasn't audible, but it was so loud I thought it was audible. And I heard, someday you'll preach like that. Someday you'll pray for people like that. And I turned to see what my cousin Joe said, and he was gone. I turned to see what my cousin Donnie said, and he was gone. I'm standing there by myself. And I thought, who said that? And then I realized it was God. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. I, 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 I never, even, never even thought of preaching. I was going to follow in the footsteps of my father. He represented everything I wanted to be. My dad raced automobiles all my young life. My dad did paint body work. My dad restored classic cars, built hot rods and race cars. And he started teaching me all that when I was nine years old. And that's all I ever wanted to do. So I thought, God's fouling up my plans. So I thought, I'm never telling anybody about this experience. And I thought, as a you know little 10-year-old boy, if I never tell anybody, then I won't have to do it and God will realize he made a mistake, and he'll go find somebody who really wants to do that. And I never told a soul. All those years, my mom and dad never knew. And then, of course, Carolyn and I married later, and she was a Pentecostal girl. And I never even heard the word Pentecostal. I didn't know what a Pentecostal was until I married her, and I learned what a Pentecostal was. In fact, it drove me nuts. Praying for me all the time. Preaching to me all the time. I'd come, my dad and I would haul race cars all over the southern part of the United States. And I'd get home in the wee hours of the morning. And the last thing I wanted to do was hear a sermon. I just wanted to go to bed. I had to get up the next morning, go to work, you know. And I'd, I'd lay there, and I was so worn out. And this hand would come over on my chest. <laughs> and she'd start praying in that language. I hated it because I didn't know what she was saying. And I'd take her hand and put it back on her side of the bed. Then in a little while, that hand would come back over. She'd start praying in English. I guess she got the interpretation. I don't know. And it was always the same thing. Lord, don't let him have any more fun until he surrenders his life to you. I'd take her hand and put it back over there. i say, Carolyn, I'm having fun. No, you're not. You just think you are. You'll never have real fun until you get saved. And I didn't like that. I didn't want somebody preaching to me all the time. Then her mother jumped in. Oh, dear God. I had two of them gang up on me. You ever had two Pentecostal women gang up on you? 
Have you noticed when the NASCAR races come on, you don't hear them introducing, and Jerry Savelle coming around turn three, or I wanted to race the Indy car. You never hear in the Indy, Indy 500, and Jerry Savelle is taking the lead. No, you know why? Two Pentecostal women ganged up on me. And here I be today, praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm so glad they didn't give up on me. Oh, I'm glad they didn't give up on me, praise God. So in those early days, now see, I didn't have religion to unlearn. I had an advantage over a lot of people because I had no religious tradition to unlearn. All I've ever known since I've been a believer from February the 11th, 3 o'clock in the morning, 1969, all I've ever known is faith, 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 faith. And that's all I know today. And what I learned 55 years ago, I'm still applying today, and it's still working today, praise God. Why? Because it's the Word of God. And the Word is forever settled in heaven. Not one jot nor tittle will ever pass away. Amen. So this is, this is all I've known, and I, I, I say often, my mama didn't raise a fool. I am not changing. I'm not going for anything else because this is still working for me. Hallelujah. Amen. And it'll work for anybody that'll stick with it. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's talk about highest expectations. I, I'm, I'm a man who has high expectations. One of the things I learned from Will Roberts, he, he challenged me all the time. One of the biggest thinkers I've ever met. I miss him greatly. And uh, Brother Roberts had a plaque on his desk. No little plans made here. I have one of those plaques you know, on my desk at home and in my office. No little plans made here. If you were in Oral Roberts' presence and started, started talking small, He'd just turn his back on you and walk off. I said, Brother Robert, I, I, I'm not through talking yet. He said, I'm through listening until you start talking big dreams and, and, and start thinking bigger. I'll listen to you. Till then, I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Now, I didn't get mad over that. I loved the challenge that it presented to me. Amen. Because he, he raised my level up, you know, uh, he, he, so many times when, when I was with him and, and we preached together, uh, he, 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 he challenged me. You know, he was, you, you don't build a university like he did and pay cash when, and, and build it on a part of Tulsa that everybody thought he was crazy when he chose that part. It was nothing but pasture. Nothing was out there. It was just farmland. And God told him to build the university out there. And he just went out and drove a stake in the ground and told some of his friends, that's a university right there. <laughs> that's thinking big. Yeah. You know, most people, all they saw was a field full of grass right. and cows. Right. But Oral saw a university. Yeah. And that's all he talked until he got it built, praise God. Amen. And I was privileged to serve on the Board of Regents of that university for 20 years and, and privileged to be in his presence many times. And it, he was always challenging me to think bigger, think bigger, think bigger. And I loved it. And then, of course, you know, the other gentlemen, everything I know about world evangelism, I learned from T.L. and Daisy Osborne. They were big thinkers. They, they preached to millions of people. And, and when I first started going uh, to Africa back in 1978, I went to Tulsa and studied T.L. and Daisy Osborne's films of their crusades, and I didn't know anything else, so I just copied what they did. Now, my crowds over there were not near as big as theirs. They were, they were preaching to hundreds of thousands of people in an open field. I started out with about 5,000 in an open field. And, of course, it grew and grew and grew, and then we preached all over Africa. But everything I know about world evangelism I learned from them. They kept in, in, in challenging me to raise my expectations. Amen. 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 And today, 
I'm a man with high expectations. I'm a big dreamer, praise God. And I don't let anybody talk me out of my dreams. Hallelujah. You know, you remember Joseph? He was a dreamer. And his brothers, they'd say, when, he, when, he, when he's in their prison, here comes that dreamer. Some people you just can't share your dreams with. They'll try to talk you out of it. Some people, and most of them are relatives, <laughs> feel that it's their call in life to pull you down. Anybody have relatives like that? Oh, they all, my relatives all thought I'd lost my mind. I mean, they knew I was living my dream. I wasn't living God's dream for my life, but I was living my dream. I own my own automotive business at 21 years old, and I'm doing exactly what I dreamed I would do at nine years old. Okay? And they all knew, you know, that I'm, Jerry's living his dream. He's talked about this all of his life. But then when I'd shut it all down and began to prepare for full-time ministry, Jerry's lost his mind. He's become a fanatic. But guess who they called when they were in trouble? The fanatic. Guess who they still call when they're in trouble? The fanatic, you know. They said, he's a nut, but God does things for that nut, you know. <laughs> Never said anything like it. My, my wife said one time, said, Jerry, you beat anything I've ever seen. She said, I've been in this all my life, and this is when I'm just, you know, a few years older than the Lord. She said, I've never met anybody in my life that God does more stuff for than you. She told a group of people one time, my husband just thinks it and God does it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember one time, uh, my, my grandfather, I was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi on a farm, and it's where my dad was raised and where I was born. My grandfather bought that farm in 1927. And... Uh, we had, eventually we had about 70 acres and, and uh, we were totally self-contained. Cattle, hogs, chickens, crops. You know, we didn't have to go to town unless we just wanted to. And, and I, 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 I loved my grandfather. I loved being around him. And uh, uh, when, when he passed away, just before he passed away, he, he never owned a new vehicle in his life. In 1960, he was still driving a 1929 Model A pickup and a 1949 Chevy sedan. And my dad kept telling him, it's his dad, Dad, I don't want you out there on that road in that old Model A pickup and that, that old 49 Chevrolet. You, you got money. You know, my dad, my grandfather was a miser. He hid his money. After the, the Depression, he didn't trust another bank as long as he lived. He buried his money on the farm. When I found that out, I became a treasure hunter. <laughs> I found money buried all over that farm. I found it in the hayloft. I found it in that old Model A pickup under the seat. I found it uh, between the mattress, uh, the, the spring, bed springs. I found it under the linoleum rug, you know. Uh, it was everywhere. In fact, I never sold that farm until I made sure I'd found all of Grandpa's money, okay? Because <laughs> I inherited after they all passed away. And, but, but finally, my dad talked my grandfather into buying a new pickup truck in 1960. And it was a 1960 Apache 10 pickup. And Grandpa came over to Shreveport where we had moved and, and went to the Chevrolet dealership where my dad worked. And, and Dad said, now, Grand Dad, uh, this truck is going to cost you $1,819.52. Uh, $1, Bring the cash. I know you got it. Dig it up on the farm somewhere. <laughs> and so hey, Grandpa come over there with a pocket full of cash and bought that truck. And I was 14 years old. I didn't even have a driver's license yet. And he was so afraid he was going to scratch it up, he had me drive it back to Mississippi 180 miles and I could hardly see over the dash and it's standard ship and I'd have, to, I'd have to look for the clutch and make sure I didn't run off the road, you know. And I drove that truck all the way to Vicksburg, Mississippi. He put it in the barn and wouldn't drive it because he's afraid he's going to scratch it up. Now, when he died in 1964, I eventually inherited that truck and I'm so glad he wouldn't put any miles on it because it's like a brand new truck today 
and it's only got 60,000 miles on it now. Oh, my Amen. So if, I had, if my dad had not moved us out of Mississippi, and particularly off of that farm where my grandfather was, because I love my grandfather. I love being around him. I would have grown up thinking like him. I would have been poverty-minded. But God had plans, and we didn't know this. My, my dad would have never moved from Mississippi. My dad thought Jesus was going to set up his throne when he comes back in Vicksburg, Mississippi. <laughs> and it took a friend of his that he grew up with who was a mechanic, and he moved to Shreveport, and he went to work at the Ford dealership, and he called my dad and said, J.W., you can make more money in Shreveport than you can in Vicksburg. He said, come on over. I've already talked to them. They need a body man, and they got a position open for him. And that's how we wound up in Louisiana. Got me off of that farm away from my grandfather. Now I'd go over there and spend my summers with him, you know, until he passed away. But if I'd, have, if I'd have stayed there with my grandfather, it would have taken a whole lot longer for God to change my mindsets, okay? And my grandmother, she was so funny. Now, Grandpa, he, he went to the Calvary Baptist Church. It was about five miles from the farm. But Grandma didn't like going there. And, and we had, there was a, a black church on our road. Now, we lived on a dirt road. Eventually, we got uptown and got gravel. And, and they, I could walk to the, to the black church. And Grandma would say, first church I ever went to in my life was a black church. And Grandpa wanted to take me to Calvary Baptist. And Grandma said, don't go. He said, they're dead there. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the black church is more lively, son. Go with me. First church I ever went to in my life was a black church down, there, down the road, you know, because they were more lively. That's what Grandma said. And so anyway, when, when Dad moved us to Shreveport, I didn't know, Dad didn't know, that God was aligning us, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to get me in position to be where I am today. Yeah. Well, I wound up eventually moving on the street that my future wife lived on. She lived down the street. Carol and I grew up on the same street. We, we'd known each other since we, you know, grade school. Now, I, you know, I never dated her when we got older. And, but I come home from college, after I'd been in college for a couple of years, I come home one weekend, and I saw her. I said, is that the little girl that lived down the street? <laughs> She's changed. <laughs> Hallelujah, looking good. <laughs> and so we had our first date, and then six months later, we're talking getting married. And uh, she told me the night before our wedding, she said, now, Jerry, the day your parents moved you and on Millard Street. You remember, you came on your bicycle after they unloaded your parents' furniture. You come down the road on your bicycle checking out the new neighborhood, and me and my sister were playing out in the front yard, and you waved at us. Of course, I didn't know who they were. And I went down the end of the road just checking out the new neighborhood, and I turned back and came back, and they weren't out in the yard anymore. And I didn't know this. She never told me until the night before our wedding. She said, that morning when you rode by there, I went in the house, I told my mother, I just saw the boy I'm going to marry, and we're going to preach the gospel, and we're, he's going to be saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, preach the gospel, and go to Africa. I said, if you'd have told me that when we'd grown up, I'd have never spoke to you again. You know? She didn't know anything about me hearing the call of Oral Roberts, and it was the same year that we moved on that street. Okay? And so... You know, God, you know, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But Dad didn't know that God was ordering his steps. He just thought, a friend said you can make a little more money over here because Vicksburg had become economically depressed and, and he, he, he made a little more money. That's what got us to Shreveport. That's what got us to Millard Street. That's what got us, you know, introducing me to my future wife. And she laid in on me like <laughs> white on rice, they say, you know, <laughs> and, and, and trying to get me excited about the things of God. And it took Kenneth Copeland coming to Shreveport to her church that she grew up in. It preached the word of faith, and that's the message that changed my life. 
Okay? So notice all these steps that it took to get me where I am today. And I think it's very interesting. You talk about favor. If this is not a favor story, I don't know what is. Notice it took Kenneth Copeland to come to Shreveport to preach the Word of God like I'd never heard before. And the moment I heard it, I knew it was true. And I did not, I did not back away. I surrendered my life that, that, that 3 o'clock that morning. And, and, and then God brought Kenneth Hagin into my life, Oral Roberts into my life, the Osbournes into my life. Why? Because he wanted to surround me with big thinkers. He wanted to surround me with people that wouldn't quit. He, he, he wanted to surround me with people when they, when they set a go, they didn't give up until it was accomplished. Amen. <clears throat> and that's... <clears throat> That's, that's the story of my life. I can't help but think big because I was trained by big thinkers. I can't help but believe God for the impossible because I was trained with people who believe God for the impossible. Amen? Amen. So my expectations are high. There's some things I'm expecting this year that I, I, I believe some of them, I'm that close to the manifestation of them. And God is no respecter of persons. If he wants it happening to me, he wants it happening to you. However, it won't happen unless you stay in faith, remain focused on the promises, don't allow anything in the world to distract you. Then you qualify, hallelujah, for progression, advancement, promotion, and your highest expectations being fulfilled. Now, I've given you plenty of time to find Psalm 62. Have you found it yet? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, let's, let's look, first of all, in verse 1, Psalm 62. <clears throat> and notice it says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. Now, most of you know that the word salvation is an all-inclusive word. It includes not only being saved from sin, but it also includes uh, deliverance. It includes preservation. It includes safety. It includes healing or health. It includes peace, and it includes prosperity. So when you see the word salvation, think all those things because that's a part of salvation. It, in, it includes all these things. One commentary made this statement about salvation, and particularly Psalm 62.1. It sums up, the word salvation, sums up all the blessings bestowed by God on men through Christ's obedience to go to the cross in order to obtain their redemption. So it sums up all the blessings. Salvation. It, in, it includes all the blessings that God intends for you to enjoy in your life. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're saved? Hallelujah. You are a candidate for all the blessings through salvation that God wants to bestow on every human being. Praise God. Now, the message translation says, everything I need comes from Him. Everything I need comes from Him. Verse 5 and 6 says this, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Now, when your expectations come from God, then you can rest assured He will cause them to come to pass if you won't give up. Now, I don't, I don't just, you know, dream up stuff and hope God will bless it. No, I get my expectation, expectations from Him, either through personal fellowship with him or from his word. The Bible says in the beginning was God, in the beginning was his word. So he's never going to say anything that's contrary to his word. So every expectation I have in my life, I either got it from my intimate fellowship with him one-on-one -on -one, or through something I found in the word of God, a promise, and it created expectation. So I can say my expectations are from God. I mean, if you can say your expectations are from God. 
Now, if they're not from God, he's under no obligation to bring them to pass. Didn't get a whole lot of response. Maybe my mic went off. If your expectations didn't come from God, he's under no obligation to bring them to pass. You know, back in those early days when, you know, there, when I first started, there was no such term as Word of Faith Church. That didn't exist yet. And back in those early days, we didn't preach in churches because most churches didn't want to hear a word we had to say because we didn't preach religious tradition. So we had to go to a neutral place, auditoriums, and, and people back in the early days, they'd stay away in crowds, and then eventually, you know, uh, people would get to talking about, the, you know, the message and so forth, and it, it began to build. I remember when we first did our, uh, did the first Believers Convention in Anaheim. Any, any of you attend any of those Believers Convention in Anaheim? I remember the first one. That, well, we weren't in that big arena. We were in a smaller building in, the, uh, in that area, you know. And, uh, and I, uh, Brother Copeland would furnish Carol and I a room that overlooked that building, and we see people trickle in, and they sit on the lawn out there waiting for the doors to open, you know, and then later, I mean, they started growing and growing and growing, and then, man, they went, and we went to the arena, and there'd be hundreds of people sitting out on the grass just waiting for the doors to open, and I started praying for the ushers, because, boy, when those doors opened, it was a mad dash to the front row. They were Christians, but get out of my way. I'll kill you if you get in that front row, you know. <laughs> and, and I'd stand up there and look out my window at all this. And there was such a hunger. And, man, you get in there, there's like electricity in the air in those, in those believers' committee. You remember that? And then over a period of time, I noticed that less people were coming. I'd see less people sitting in the grass waiting for the doors open. I asked Brother Cooper one time, I said, why do you think that's happened? I'll never forget his answer. He said, for a lot of Christians, the Word of God has lost its entertainment value. That's powerful. People wanted to be entertained instead of hear the truth. And then that moved right on over into the praise and worship, and a lot of the praise and worship was no longer praise and worship. It was entertainment. Don't shout me down now. Amen. You know, the Christians started wanting to be entertained. Well, now I see, I see uh, uh, we've, we've come full circle. Now they're packing out the place again. Amen. Now they're hungry again. Amen. You know, adversity, chaos, right. crazy world. Yes. Satan over, always overplays his hand. Yes. Chaos, adversity, yes. and living in a crazy world has a way of driving people back to God. Because they find out nothing else works, right. nothing else, nothing, everything else is, you know, everything uh, is is crashing that they depended on before. Yeah. Does anybody do business with a bank that's changed its name at least five times in the last twenty five years? <laughs> what does that tell you? <laughs> I've been, I've been at the same bank ever since I moved to Fort Worth, Texas. 1970, it was the same name. It was kind of a family-owned bank until they sold out and corporate bought it. Now, used to, I could walk in the door. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Brother Jerry. The president would come down. Shake hands with you. Hey, uh, you got time to go get a cup of coffee? It was very personal. Now, it's all corporate. They don't even know your name. You know? And it's changed its name. I almost went and changed banks. <laughs> because usually when they're changing names, changing names, changing names, it just goes to prove everything in the world is temporal. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. What's that old saying? The only thing that is constant in the world is change. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Amen. Change. Everything's changing. Why is everything changing? Because we're approaching, rapidly approaching the end. Yes. Amen? Amen? So, it's never been more important than it is right now to stay focused on the promises. Amen. Stay in faith. 
Don't let anything in the world distract you. And God will see to it, no matter what's happening to the rest of the people in the world, you will progress. You will advance. You will experience promotion. Your highest expectation will be fulfilled. And when that's happening to you, and it's not happening to the rest of the world, eventually they're going to seek you out and want to know, how are you doing this? Where are you getting all this? And now you become an evangelist. It's the God I serve. Would you like to know my God? Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Amen. So notice here, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Verse 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. The message translation says, I'll wait as long as he says, because everything I hope for comes from him, so why not? How many of you are willing to wait for as long as it takes? A lot of Christians are not willing to do that. A lot of Christians have the mindset, if it don't happen before dark, I'm not playing anymore. There's a lot of quitters in the body of Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're not one of them. <laughs> Amen. Amen? A lot of quitters. And I, I you know, I've been preaching for 55 years. I, I, I've read this book a few times. I can't find one promise where God promises to bless the quitter. No one. Anybody found one? If you have found one, let me know because then I'll change my sermon. But, but I haven't found one verse, one promise where God promises to bless those who quit. In fact, the book of Hebrews says uh, in, 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 I believe it's chapter 10, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews, which most theologians believe is Apostle Paul, he says, we are not of those who turn back. We are not of those who turn back. I read that 45, 49 years ago, and I said, I'm not one of those who turn back. I'll never turn back. Amen? So the psalmist here is saying, according to the message translation, I will wait as long as he says, because everything I hope for comes from him anyway, so why not wait? What other choice do I have? Nobody else has promised me what he's promised me. Nobody else has been as good to me as he's been to good to me, as he's been good to me. So why wouldn't I wait? He's come through before. Why wouldn't he come through again? I have this testimony. After 55 years, he never disappointed me one time. Not one time. Hallelujah. I believe I'll just give the Lord a shout myself. Hallelujah. Amen. Now the Passion Translation says it this way. He's my champion defender. There's no risk of failure with God. Isn't that great? He's my champion defender, and there's no risk of failure with God. So why would I let worry paralyze me? He will not let me fail. Isn't that awesome? That's the Passion Translation, praise God. He's my defender champion. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> and most of you know that when Paul wrote this letter to the believers in Philippi, he was in prison facing death, okay? And uh, they, they were not going to release him ever. Or they just, they just make it so bad in there that he just died in prison. But most theologians agree that even though this is the worst of circumstances that Paul ever experienced, now you can go read in Corinthians a list of things he went through. And you and I will never go through most of those things that he went through. But when in Philippi, and he, uh, when, when he wrote this letter to the believers in Philippi, they, they say he was in the worst prison of the day. And they, he, they didn't expect him to ever leave that prison alive. But most theologians say, and if you can study it for yourself, it was the happiest letter he ever wrote. You will find the word joy, rejoicing, numerous times throughout the book and the letter to the Philippian believers. 
It, they, the theologians call it the joy letter. And he wrote a joy letter in his worst of times. Amen. Don't you wish a lot of preachers would follow suit? On, yeah. You get letters from preachers? If you don't give, we're going to die. If you don't give, this ministry is going down the tubes. Give till it hurts. That's not, that's not letters like Paul wrote. He's, he's facing death. There's a jailer coming into his cell every day and saying, Paul, if you don't denounce Christ, today you'll die. You know what his attitude was? Promise? <laughs> For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Uh, could you do it before dark? <laughs> well, how, what are you going to do with a guy like that? Satan threats to take you out, and he said, help yourself. You'll help me fulfill my greatest goal. I'll be with Christ. And Satan scratched his head and said, uh, we didn't figure he'd answer that way, you know. What do we do with a guy like this? And then notice this in verse 19. He says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Remember what salvation means? Deliverance, preservations, safety, peace, prosperity, health. He said, I know. Notice, he didn't say, I hope. He said, I know this will turn. How'd you like to have that kind of positive attitude? About everything you go through, it's like water off a duck's back. I know this is going to turn. It's just a matter of time. God's on my side. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Why would I lose my joy over this? Praise God, I believe I'll just shout like Paul. Hallelujah. What, what's the devil going to do with a person like that? He has no defense for it. No defense for it. What he wants you to do is have a pity party. Nothing ever works for me. I don't know why God let me down. That's exactly what he hopes you'll do. But if you're going to follow Paul's example in your worst of times, you're going to have your greatest joy. <laughs> Amen? And he says, I know this will turn to my salvation and your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 29. According, let, let's put these two thoughts together. I know this shall turn, in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation. Yes. Notice, this is going to turn, I know it's going to turn, and it's going to turn according to my earnest expectation. Yes. So what is Paul saying? My expectation is to be delivered out of this situation. Now, he writes in here, he tells the believers there in Philippi, he said, I'm really betwixt two. He said, I, I have a decision to make. He said, now, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, now, for me personally, I wouldn't mind dying at all because to die is gain and, and I'll be with Christ. To live is Christ. I'll keep living for Christ. He says, I'm in a dilemma. I don't know which one to do. Did you notice? He didn't say, uh, I really have no say in this. It's the Roman government that decides my destiny. No, he said, I'm betwixt two. I'm trying to make a decision here. And then the next verse he says, and I'm paraphrasing, I've decided to stay because you need me. He decided to stay. Amen. It was his decision yep. to stay. And he said, I'm going to stay because you need me, and I want to teach you the joy of believing. Isn't that amazing? The joy of believing. How many of you have joy in believing? Hallelujah. A lot of Christians don't. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can hear it in their, in their, in their voice, their, their, in, their, in their testimony. Brother Hagin used to say, you can locate someone where they are spiritually in about five minutes, just listen to what comes out of their mouth. Amen. You know, I'd spend a lifetime with them. Right. Amen. Amen. You know, and this used to be a, a phrase I would hear in my early days when I started going to that Pentecostal church with Carolyn after I came to the Lord. And, and they, I knew they loved God. These people, were they loved God with all their heart but they didn't have a lot of word in them. And they had a lot of religious tradition, but there was no question they loved God. 
And they, they love the move of the Spirit, you know. But as far as having, you know, a depth of revelation knowledge, and I'd, I'd hear them say things like, uh, Jerry, uh, you, need to, you need to turn your life over to the Lord. And said, uh, be like me. So I'd watch their life. You know, I don't want to be like them. <laughs> That's the last thing I want to be is like them. And then, I, I, you know, I'm the kind of person where I'm inquisitive. And when my dad was teaching me body work, the first thing he did was set me down on a stool and said, just watch me, son. Well, you can learn a lot by observation. But I want to, why did you do it that way, Dad? Why did you use that tool? Why did you use that hammer? Now, I, I want to know the, the ins and outs, okay? And so people would say, Jerry, uh, why don't you just get, quit fighting God? Just, just give your life to the Lord. Be like us. And so I'd watch him for a while. And then finally I'd ask him, well, why would I want to be like you? And, and you know, they hesitate for a while and say, well, I'm saved. I said, well, I believe you're saved, but I don't want the kind of life you're living because you're never sure of anything. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? Well, you stand up in church and supposed to give a testimony, and I thought it's supposed to be for God, but most of the time it's for the devil. He gets more credit than God in the testimonies. I couldn't figure that out. I thought, isn't this a testimony for God? They'd say, uh, the devil visited our house this week, made us all sick, blessed be his holy name. And then right at the end, but we all know our God is able. You know, inquisitive minds want to know. Sure. So I walk up to him and say, one time I just walked up, they kept saying the same thing. Uh, the devil visited our house this week, made us all sick. My husband lost his job. Blessed be his holy name. But we all know our God is able. And I'd walk up to him and say, did he? Huh? Did he? Did who? What? I said, you said, we all know God is able. Did he do what you said he's able to do? This is the response I'd get. You never know what God will do. I said, and you want me to trust somebody, turn my life over to somebody, you never know what they're going to do? No, thank you. I don't want to be like you. Amen? And then, oh, when I did finally go headlong into this, you know, some of them, seriously, when they see me walk down the aisle to get a seat at church in the, in the, in the Sunday morning, and they'd see me come, someone would back up and go down another aisle. Because what they want me to do, they didn't want me to rock the boat, don't ask any questions, just do what we tell you and be like us. I don't want to be like you. I don't see any victory in your life. Come on. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. They knew the questions were coming. If they came down the same aisle I came down. Come on. <laughs> we never know what God's going to do. You will know what God's going to do if you read the book. Amen. 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 That's a revelation of the will of God. I know what God will do. He's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. It's in the book. Right. Amen? Amen? Look to neighbor and say, just keep reading the book. You'll know what God's going to do. <laughs> now, listen to this. Paul says, I know this situation will turn. He said, I'm betwixt two. I'm, I'm endeavoring to make a decision here. And while he's writing the letter, he answered his own dilemma. I've decided to stay. Because you need me, and I want to teach you the joy of believing. Amen. It's a joy to believe God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I call my life adventures in faith, not tragedies in faith. I, I, don't, I don't cry when I talk about faith. I live by faith. Can you help me? <laughs> I actually had this happen to me in a little church in Arkansas in the boondocks. Little wood, wood frame church, and I talked about living by faith. And on the way out, two ladies were in the hall, and one of them said, Did you hear that young feller? You know, this is Arkansas. Young feller. Not F E L L O W, F E L L E R, feller. <laughs> you know, did you hear that young feller? Nobody to trust but God. I 
tapped her on the shoulder. I said, lady, don't feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for the person that don't know how to trust God. Amen. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm having a time of my life. Amen. I remember when, when I surrendered my life to the Lord, I had two cousins that just thought I'd lost my mind. And one of them, I, I went to visit in Oklahoma, and he said, you used to be cool, now you're a preacher. I said, I'm cooler than ever now. He said, you, you probably don't have any fun now that you're a preacher. I said, when's the last time you saw blind eyes open? When's the last time you saw people throw crutches in the sky and walk away? When's the last time you saw people get out of wheelchair? When's the last time you saw cripples walk? Uh, and you telling me I'm not having fun? I said, I'm cooler and having more fun than I've ever had. You're the one that's not cool. You're headed for hell. That's a hot place. I'm cool. Hallelujah. And I won them all to the Lord, and most of them worked for me. Praise God. Amen. One cousin, Joe. Oh, I went to visit him. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And I, I went to a little town he lived in in Henriette, Oklahoma, not too far from Tulsa. Pulled up in his driveway. He came out. And uh, I said, Joe, I hadn't seen you in a long time. I just wanted to stop by and say hi and tell you I've been praying for you. Now, he, he had become a, a law enforcement officer. And I said, uh, Joe, uh, you know, you've heard what's happened to me. And we, we grew up together. We've been very close all, these, all of our lives. And, and I want you to know the same Jesus I know. He said, well, I'm not ready for that. I said, well, there will come a time you will be. And before I leave today, I just want to know, do you know what to do? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let me share this with you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe he's raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you know how to do that? Well, that's not going to happen. No, I said, that's not what I asked you. I said, do you know how to do that? I, that's not going to happen. I said, Joe, listen. That's not what I ask you. Do you know how to do it when the time comes? It's not likely to come. I said, Joe, shut up and listen. There will come a time, and you will need to know what I just told you. Well, how do you know there will come a time? I said, because the word does not return void. God sent me to bring the word to you, and you will never forget what I've just said to you. I'm going now. I'm leaving, but I just wanted to know you know what to do. I got in my car, and he, he beating on my window. I, I don't, I don't, and I told him last thing, I said, one day you're going to be just like me. And he beat on my window and said, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to be like you. And I backed out of his driveway, still beating on my window. I don't want to be like you. I said, it's too late. And I started going down the road. He's chased me. And he said, I don't want to be like you. He's been like me now, and he's worked for me for 45 years. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. The word doesn't return void. Amen. Don't feel sorry for me because I'm a preacher. I'm having a time of my life. Hallelujah. Woo! <laughs> Amen. Now, listen to the message translation from, for Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Uh, let, me, let me define that earnest expectation first in verse 20. Uh, he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope. This is why he says, I know this will turn. This situation is going to turn. I'm leaving this place. The earnest expectation means characterized by a firm confidence. An earnest expectation. When your expectations are earnest, that means it will be characterized by a firm confidence. And then the message translation says this. I'm going to keep the celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. Isn't that a wonderful attitude, praise God, about adversity? And of course, history tells us he did get out of that prison. And they couldn't kill him until he decided he'd finished his course. That's right. Satan tried every way possible. Shipwrecks, snake bites, angry mobs, stonings. But they couldn't kill him until he wrote to Timothy and said, My departure is at hand. 
I have kept the faith. I've finished my course. Amen. Amen. And, of course, history, you know, tells us how he died, but he didn't feel a thing. His spirit was already, he'd already checked out. All they did was beat up a, a body and, and buried it. But his spirit was already gone. Hallelujah. Amen. What a way to live. And by the way, he was a Christian. <laughs> this is the way Christians ought to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Our decision, not the devil's, our decision, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. So our expectations are from him. That's where our expectation should be coming from. Now, you all know Romans chapter 12 about the renewing of the mind. The Bible, uh, the message translation for Romans 12 to King James, be not conformed to this world, be, re, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The message translation says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you just fit into it without even thinking Instead, fix your attraction on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Amen? Amen. Fix your, uh, your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Don't let this world change you or form your opinions or determine your destiny. We are not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. I don't think like them. I don't talk like them. I don't act like them. I don't live like them. Hallelujah. Amen. Why? Because I've renewed, I've been at this process called the renewing of the mind for 55 years. And, and it's changed the way I think. It's changed my perspective. It's changed my attitude. It's changed my expectations. And it all came from this book. Amen. Hallelujah. So if we stay in faith and remain focused on the promises of God, and do not allow anything in this world to distract us. This year and beyond could be the finest years of your Christian life. Hallelujah. The absolute best years of your Christian life. Anybody interested in that? Why don't we go ahead and give him praise in advance? What do you say? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. Stay focused on what God has promised and you'll experience your highest expectations being fulfilled. I heard, I, I, over the years, I've had the privilege of, of doing motivational seminars with some of the Fortune 500 co companies. They, they bring me in not as a preacher, but they consider me a motivational speaker. That's how I used to do chapel services for several of the, the professional football teams, 49ers, the Bears, Cowboys, Packers. And, and they'd bring me in as a motivational speaker. And I, I read a lot of books from motivational speakers. And, and I've discovered all of their principles came from the Bible. They just don't know that. Napoleon Hill, think and grow rich. Where did he get that? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Amen. They're all Bible principles. And, and most of these motivational speakers don't even know they're quoting Bible principles. Now, one motivational speaker that I heard said this, and I wrote it down. Having positive expectations means you're setting yourself up for failure and disappointment. I, I thought he was a motivational speaker. If I went to one of his seminars and I heard that, I probably would have lost the motivation I had when I got there. Listen to that again. Having positive expectations means you're setting yourself up for failure and disappointment. That's not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. no. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse, I mean, chapter 10 and verse 28 says, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Yes. Another translation uses the word, The expectations of the righteous shall be gladness. So the Bible doesn't say that if you have positive expectations, you're setting yourself up for failure. The Bible says if you have positive expectations, you're setting yourself up for gladness. <laughs> and what, what, how does gladness come? The fulfillment of what you're expecting. 
I mean, have you been believing God for certain things for some time and it all, and then suddenly it comes to pass and you're going to tell me it didn't bring joy, it didn't bring gladness? You didn't tell somebody about it? The expectations of the righteous bring gladness. Why? Why? Because the Bible says also in the book of Proverbs, thy expectations shall not be cut off. Another translation, the message translation says, your expectation, if you have expectations, you will not walk away empty-handed. Hallelujah. And another translation says, you won't end up with an armload of nothing. <laughs> I like that. Amen. If you have expectations that you got from him and from his word, then you're not going to walk away with an armload of nothing. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a good shout, praise God. Now listen to this, Proverbs eleven twenty three. 23. The desire of the righteous is only good. The desire. Desire can also be translated as expectation. The word desire, uh, uh, one definition is that which is earnestly longed for. And here it says, the desire of the righteous is only good, meaning that it's going to end up good. Something good is going to happen to you, as old Roberts would say. Amen. That which you earnestly desire will end in good. Amen. I remember years ago, uh, we were flying to, Carol and I were flying to West Virginia to do a meeting. And my plane was in the shop, and so we flew uh, commercial airlines and we're sitting there and I, I had just got my grandfather's truck I, I, uh, it, it didn't need a, a lot of restoration but I wanted it to look absolutely exactly the way it did when it came out of the factory in 1960 so there's a few things I wanted to do to it and I got them done and I just got it back and, and uh, I had taken pictures of it and Carolyn hadn't seen it yet and I was showing her pictures of it, and she said, uh, uh, I'm so glad you got your grandfather's truck. I know how much it means to you. I said, you know, Carolyn, uh, after he got that truck, he didn't drive it very much, but he managed to get a 1953 Chevrolet Bel Air, two-door hardtop, 53 Chevrolet Bel Air. I said, now I have, my, I have my, my grandfather's rifles. I have my grandfather's shotguns. I have my grandfather's truck. I said, all I need is a 53 Chevy Bel Air two-door hardtop. Brown bottom and beige top. Now, if she was here, she could tell you I'm not making this up. We got to that church in Virginia, West Virginia. I preached that night. The pastor said, we have a, a dinner prepared for you. And if you don't mind, I'm going to have my staff join us. They all want to just be around you and ask you questions if it's okay. I said, sure. So he's got about 25 people in this room there at the church, and the associate pastor and his wife are sitting across from Carolyn and I. And pastor and I are talking, and in a little while, the associate pastor said, Brother Jerry, could I ask you something? I said, sure. He said, uh, I have a 53 Chevrolet Bel Air two-door hardtop, brown and beige. Would you like to have it? I looked at Carolyn. She looked at me, and that's when she told the pastor, my husband just thinks it, and God does it. <laughs> and I wound up with exactly the same car, not the same car, but same color. Everything about it was identical to the one my grandfather had. Now, those are not coincidences. If they are, they happen to me all the time. That's favor. <laughs> that's that's the expectations of the righteous turn into good things, hallelujah. Don't let anybody rob you of your expectation. Don't let anybody talk you out of your dreams. Amen? Because we have entered into a time where I believe more dreams of the body of Christ are going to be fulfilled. More expectations in the body of Christ are going to be fulfilled. Amen? Why? Because God is going to use it as an evangelistic tool. We don't have much time left to win a dying world. 
and God's going to use all of this, our dreams coming to pass, our expectations being fulfilled, and people recognizing it. Just like in Psalm, what is it, Psalm 122, and it says, even the heathen said, the Lord has been good to them. <laughs> even the heathen were, were noticing the goodness of God in, his, in the lives of his people. And they came and said, there, God has been good to them. Amen. That's what God wants done in our day because we don't have much time left and there's still a lot of people who need Christ in their life. And God's going to use your life as an evangelistic tool to draw them in. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Come on, give the Lord your best shout tonight. Glory to God. Is that your best shout? Give the Lord your best shout. Amen. I'll close it with this. This same motivational speaker said this. I take notes. And if I, don't, if, if, I, if I don't have something to write it on when I hear it, I say this. Lord, I have the mind of Christ. I'll remember everything that was important, and I'll write it down when I get home. <laughs> so this same motivational speaker who told people, don't get your hopes up too high. It'll end in disappointment. I don't know where he. I don't know where he even has got the title motivational speaker. He said, "By not setting expectations for yourself, but just going with the flow, then you'll uh, you'll take a better approach to life." Can you believe anybody invited this man to say anything? I would have got up and walked out. Listen to this. By not setting expectations for yourself, but just going with the flow, then you'll take a better approach to life. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible told us, don't go with the flow. Don't, don't allow the world's culture to have an effect on you. I wrote in my notes, I will never go to this motivational speaker seminar. <laughs> Amen. And I hope you never go to him either. I'm not going to give you his name because you might look him up and decide to go. He'll talk you out of everything you believe. Amen. Amen. Motivational speaker. Dear Lord, sound like to me is a dream destroyer. Don't allow the world to rob you of your expectations. Stay with what God says you can expect and he will not disappoint you. Amen. Push beyond your previous boundaries. Push beyond your previous limitations. Hold on to your belief. I'm just reading out of my notes here in closing. Hold on to your belief that God is going to cause good things to happen in your life. To believe is to respect. To believe is to expect. Faith, real Bible faith, and positive expectancy are divinely linked together. Amen. Real Bible faith expects. So what if people call you and make fun of you? Here comes that dreamer like they did Joseph. Well, who got the last word in that story? Joseph. Amen. His dream came to pass. So don't let people talk you out of your dreams. Don't let them talk you out of your expectations. Just keep feeding on the Word of God. And the next thing you know, your expectations will get even higher and higher and higher. And if you stay in faith, don't allow anything to, in the world to distract you. Remain focused on the Word. Those expectations are going to be fulfilled. And God will get all the praise for it. Amen. Give the Lord a good shout of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand if you will, please.